This is Pod Populi. Podcast for the people. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. Hi again, everyone. It's Brian Howie. Welcome to the Great Love Debate, the world's number one dating and relationship podcast. Since 2015, I am here in the very fine studios of Pod Populi, podcast for the people. So uh, I guessed it on a podcast a week or two ago, and sadly, I forgot the name of the show. So I'll try and remember it by the end of this show. <laughs> terrible, terrible breach of of podcast etiquette. So if you're listening to this episode, very nice host person, I will make it up to you when I remember. Anyway, um, when I was on the show, she asked me, a question that that I do get asked every once in a while, and I think a lot of people ask this question, but I got asked, who is a famous or celebrity couple who you think has a great relationship? And uh, I actually have an answer to that question, but I also hate the question. I don't don't ask it. I don't like being asked it. Uh, And the bulk of the episode is going to be about why that is, but as much as I hate the question, I do have an answer to that question. So let me first answer the question, and then I'll get to get into why I don't like the question. I think it's not a good question. So my answer for most of the last decade or so when I get asked that, who is your, what famous or celebrity couple do you think has a great relationship? I always say Warren Beatty and Annette Benning. And if you're 24 listening to this, you're probably like, who the fuck is Warren Beatty and Annette Benning? Give me a Timothy Chalamet and Liz, Lily Rose Dapper, somebody like that. Anyway, Warren Beatty and Annette Benning. Warren Beatty was very famously a longtime ladies' man. He was this legendary Hollywood Lothario who pretty much dated everybody and anybody who was beautiful or pretty much that he came in contact with back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, from, from Natalie Wood to Madonna. He dated, and dating is a strong word, but he's with virtually every one of his co-stars and pretty much anyone in his celebrity sphere, folk singers, pop stars, Bond girls, supermodels. There were older women, younger women, uh, newscasters, politicians, everyone. And when during this, you know, admittedly fantastic run of bachelorhood. He was asked in an interview by, by Dick Cavett, who was a pretty good interviewer back in the day. And he asked what he asked Warren Beatty, what he thought about marriage. And Warren fairly benignly answered, I have nothing against marriage. I never got married because I didn't know that I could stay married. Maybe we have to begin admitting what marriage really is. Maybe society needs to accept that we don't have to feel terribly guilty for more than one marriage. Maybe life can be a ser- made up of a series of marriages. I don't know what to think about marriage. I know that we have to come to terms with the family unit itself, end quote. So that was his way of sort of dodging the question. I have given a similar answer in my life too, like I want to get married, but I want to do 50 years and blah, blah, blah. And you know, I always said my parents didn't seem to like it that much, anything. But he basically put himself above the fray and out of the thing that everybody else was diving into. And he did that in his 30s, into his 40s, into his 50s. And so seems like a guy set in his ways with only maybe a cursory glance at the possibility of happily ever after. Well, then at 54... He meets Annette Benning, another co-star. They did Bugsy. And now, as of the recording of this, they've been married for 32 years. Pretty much as an adult, he's been married longer than he was as a single guy catting around. So he went from that to that. From no interest to what I believe. Careful about that to be happily, steadily married for decade after decade, several decades. Old dog, new tricks. So why do I like that one? 
partly because I've been accused of being the same. I had no interest in it. Series of relationships, girlfriends, dates, no Bond girls, occasional model, whatever. So if he did it, I can do it. So there, he's able to do it. Warren did it. Warren's fine. I did that. But going back to, to, to what I said at the beginning, I hate the question. Because my real answer is, I have no idea how Warren Beatty and Annette Bening's relationship really is. Or J-Lo and Ben Affleck. Or Taylor Swift and anyone. Or your neighbor. Or my neighbor. Or your best friend. Or my best friend. We all have no idea. Maybe Warren sleeps in the guest house and has done so for 25 years. I don't know. That's between him and his staff. His gardener. Maybe Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith had years of reasons for creating an illusion of marital bliss before it all blew up, just like your friends on social media do. You love that couple? You have no idea. None. Zero. So this is what I want to take a a dive on today. The who, what, where, when, how, and most importantly, why you should raise at the very least a crooked eyebrow at that guy and that girl There is a happily ever after at the end of this life and podcast episode, I promise. So after the break, we will get into all of it right after this. And we are back. So why do we care so much? And why should we not care at all? So this goes back a long time with me, and I've thought about this. I always had this theory about what sex and the city was really about. And I I dove into it at length in my book, so to save you all the trouble, I'll summarize it here. Why did women watch that show so religiously and occasionally maniacally for a decade, plus a couple of movies? What was that about? What was that show about? I had uh, Candace Bushnell on this podcast a couple years ago. She created Sex and the City. She was the writer behind Sex. She was Carrie. Um, and I gave her this theory and she wasn't crazy that I said it, but she didn't deny it either. So I told her, and I'm telling you that that show wasn't about friendship or making it in the big city or Christian Louboutins or Jimmy Choo's. I don't think it was even about dating. It wasn't even about four friends trying to find love. That show was about one woman's quest to reform a jerk, to get him to care about her the way she cared about him, to get him to see what it is she wanted from him. That's it. And that's why women watch Sex and the City. Meanwhile, back at Miranda's, that's my Sex and the City impression, um, because you all thought that if Carrie could get big to change, you could all get your guy to change. And you cared about this character the way you cared about a real person, which is always the case with fiction and rom-coms and sitcoms and Ross and Rachel and Pam and Jim and any other imaginary couple you could sink your brain into. You wanted to see hope in them so you could find hope in you. And that's why you watch your social media feeds and your friends' behavior and whatever happened to them and how are they doing And you ask people, how did you guys meet? And all the rest for good and bad. And trust me, you equally or maybe even greater, greaterly, is that a word? (laughs) Look for the bad. If it's hard for Jennifer Aniston to find lasting love, then I must be doing okay. And I know you think that, and that's fine to think that. And you're totally doing okay. So you shouldn't need this validation or this affirmation from any other relationship. So if somebody asks you what relationship you look at is perfect, even choosing your grandparents, and I have done that with my own grandparents, even looking at them and saying, They're, they were married or they've been married for 62 years, amazing, you have no idea. You really don't. You have the illusion of what they want you to see, or you decide what you want to see, good or bad. 
But honestly, when it gets right down to it, you know a fraction of a fraction of what there is to know about a relationship. You want the green grass, that's great, we all do. But the grass is rarely going to be greener no matter where you are looking to find it. Because relationships are hard, and you know that. And the people you're looking at, they know that. The relationships have layers and nuance and ups and downs. There are, without a doubt, millions and millions of happy couples all over the world who have had relationships that work and are healthy and that last for decades. You just have to look at those from a distance. Don't get too close. Don't bring the magnifying glass up to that. You just have to accept that it does exist and it is possible. That's it, the end. Don't bring the plane down to 1,000 feet. You can see things. Your neighbor down the street who, who walks up and down and sings the praises of her wonderful husband, he probably is wonderful. He might also be gay. It doesn't make him any less wonderful. It just make, might their, make their wonderful relationship that you see different in a way that ultimately has no appeal to you. Oh, yeah, I don't want that. So that woman who, who seemingly adores her man and she looks stunning and seems to have her shit together with her house and her BMW and her three beautiful kids. Oh, my God, I wish she was my wife. She might be a psychopath when you're not looking. And you're not looking when she's a psychopath. Not to bring up another celebrity couple and not to throw anybody else under the under this bus here, but but uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas, lovely couple. Been together for 25 years. You see them at the Oscars. She's won one, he's won two. And think, wow, they're amazing. Look at that life. And then you read somewhere in some magazine that she's struggled for years with bipolar disorder and has been in and out of treatment for that. And Michael Douglas has battled his own demons and so has his son. And so then you have to think, is every day a challenge for them? And every day is not Academy Awards Day. And you think that because probably because they are normal people, regular people, just like you, which is fine for them. Take them down off the pedestal is not a criticism of them. It just means that you really don't have idea. And you never want to criticize or judge what someone is going through. Life is full of challenges and, and personal battles. But you also can't look at the glass half full all the time. Can't look at that side and say, them, that's what I want. That's the life. That's the relationship. Because you don't know. You never know. All you can know is what you want, and most of you never spend the time to even really focus on or fully understand that. You definitely spend time thinking about what you don't want, for sure. A lot of long lists and mental inventory around that. But the do want, can't say I want what they have because you don't know what they have. So don't point to your, your, your college roommate's life or the people down the street's life, or that, that TV star, or Michelle and Barack, or Blake and Gwen, or anyone else that flashes across the cover of People magazine. Their lives are almost assuredly not better, and they don't have to be. Nor are they worse. They're simply different. I know it's, it's human nature to look and judge and even be envious and, and find a roadmap and, and an example. I get it. We all do it. So even when you say, and a lot of you say, I want what my parents had, I know you think you know what they had, but you don't. You really don't. You only know one of two things, what they wanted you to see and what you want to believe. And neither is the whole story, and rarely is it the whole truth. So you focus on you, your green grass, what you want what you need, and what you can have. That's all that really matters. That's all that's going to get you there. And anybody else, you really don't know. One thing I do know, we were on the fence and around this time late in a year, and as I record this, it's getting late in 2023. 
people always say, are you going to do another year of, of Great Love Debate um, live shows? And we've been very sporadic this year. You know, I have to admit, once um, a lot of the overseas cancellations happened in our tour and we lost shows in Singapore and Auckland and London, a lot of places I really want to do, I, I admit that I have a little bit lost my mojo. But then when I go and do a show, I'm like, oh, my God, I love doing it. I'm doing it forever. So announcement uh, we are kicking off our 11th season, 11th season, our 10th anniversary show. It is really our 10th anniversary show, which starts our 11th season. Do the math on that. Um, our 10th anniversary show uh, is on sale February 6th, 2024. So if you're listening to this 2026, you missed it. If you're listening to this 2023, you got a chance to see it. Our 10th anniversary anniversary show which will be a big big one it is the boca uh black box center for the arts in boca raton florida um we've probably played that venue like five or six times and the south florida shows are always a unique brand of insane that will be both our 10th anniversary show and the show that will kick off our 11th season of live shows um so i'm excited about that so mojo is back um Go to greatlovedebate.com for uh, tickets and info on that. Shoot us an email, greatlovedebate at gmail.com. Tell us what relationship you envy, and we will shoot that down on an upcoming episode. Um, most importantly, like, share, follow, and please review this podcast. Even after 10, 11 years of this, uh, your reviews mean a lot in the podcasting ecosystem. Because as always, at The Great Love Debate, we never stop making love. See you next time. <laughs>